Welcome to the Spa Girls podcast, the self-publishing podcast for authors. You're in the right place for the best writing, marketing and publishing advice, plus interviews with industry experts and best-selling authors. I'm Shah Barrett. I'm Cheryl Phipps. I'm Wendy Vella. And I'm Trudy J. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome. Another episode. Um, this week we have an exciting guest. We've got Mia Brody with us to talk about short fiction on hey, Amazon. And- hey Mia. Hi. Hey Mia. Hey Mia. Hi. Love your so, covers. Yeah, yeah. very cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm just going to read a quick bio for Mia and then we will get right into the interview. So um Mia Brody writes steamy short or she steamy short story. Oh, oh my, my goodness! Lord. Oh, it's a Try, to start. Try that steamy one again. Short stories are they steamy? They're all short stories, aren't they, Mia? Yeah, short two stories. Yeah, okay. Steamy short stories about alpha men who fall in love with big, beautiful women. She loves happy endings, and every couple she writes will get one. When she's not writing, Mia is searching for the per- perfect slice of cheesecake and watching way too many K dramas. You can find her at miabrody.com. Yay. So I made Welcome. it through the, the bio yeah. um, just. So <laughs> now, that, that. now that you can see how professional we are in the spa, Mia, um, <laughs> <laughs> can I start out with a, um, a basic question of how did you get into writing? Like what made you start self-publishing and writing? So I come from a family of writers. I'd always been interested in writing as far as um, making it a career. But I hadn't really seen anybody do it like full time as far as that was making a living off from it. So I was kind of hesitant to do it. So I ended up going into online businesses and I ran a lot of those until I stumbled upon um, some short stories written by Hope Ford. And I knew kind of based on the numbers I was seeing, I, I have a background in marketing. So I knew based on the rankings I was seeing that she was making a full time living. I could actually kind of verify that. And I could verify that for a couple other short story writers. And I was already writing short stories in my spare time. And so I said, well, why not go ahead and start publishing them? And that was kind of my little thing was when I finally saw that there was a market for them. I was like, yes, let's do this. There's a market. There are people making a living. Let's go for it. Oh, so cool. And, and cool. you, um, when was that? How long ago was that that you sort of started? Uh, let's see, that would be December 2020 when I discovered that there were people making a living and I launched my first one in March 2021. So about four months. And I read in the genre, I read heavily within the genre during those four months. Mm. I didn't just, you know, clean <laughs> things up. I wanted to, but <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and you said it took you about 15 months to get your get you where you wanted to be, is that right? That is correct. Full-time and, living took 15 months. Wow. And how many books was that in? Um, let's see at 15 months I averaged two books a month so that was probably between 25 and 30 books wow. somewhere in there which I've heard is common for um, short stories I hear yeah. that it's closer to the 20 bookmark for both full novels but for short stories I hear it's closer to 25 or 30 mm-hmm. um, wow. so still though if you release two a month mm-hmm. for a year you're at 24 stories mm-hmm. wow. yeah, yeah. I mean assuming that you're writing to market and your covers are on point and your blurbs are on point there's a good chance that you're going to make it yeah obviously no guarantees but so what what defines a short short fiction like what what are the characteristics of the genre that you're writing in like how many words um yeah that sort of thing hero heroine what have we got i have i have seen uh short stories as short as five thousand words on amazon Mm -hmm. um i personally couldn't do it that short i admire those people that do i am closer to 12k to about 22k is my average Okay. occasionally I have something a little longer but for the main part that's usually I prefer the 20k mark that's my favorite mm-hmm. spot yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and how many how how many books are you writing two books a month is that your average currently yes I average about two months books a month and you're big on series is that right that's how you you write in series um not just in series I believe in writing within universe um for me I created a town called Courage County then I have multiple spinoffs. Um, let's see, I have the Taylor brothers in Love on the Ranch. I have the Scott brothers in Courage County Brides about more mail order brides. And I have a firefighter series in the town. So I'm really big on creating a universe. I don't know if you've ever seen the show Arrow mm-hmm. um, or NCIS. Both of yeah. those were actually, those show creators were so brilliant because they didn't just create TV shows. They created a whole universe. Arrow has multiple spinoffs. Um, NCIS has multiple spinoffs. 
Um, and not only does that increase your income, it really gives the fans what they want because they can sink into a whole um, place where they, you know, they watch this or they read it and they go, wow, I want to be there. I want to be part mm -hmm. of this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very fulfilling experience for viewers and readers. Yeah. Yeah, it makes so much sense and also you're not reinventing a new world every time you start a new book mm -hmm. so it's kind of you're developing further into the world I guess you know yeah. um yeah but you think about it as a as a reader or as a viewer of television you kind of like going back to the same yeah. place of somewhere mm -hmm. that you know that you enjoyed right to get mm -hmm. that same experience so it does make a lot of sense Absolutely. in terms of that so, so are there any other uh, other things that are for short fiction that are must-haves around in that genre do you think or is it just it's, it's mainly to do with the length and that's like I'm, I'm thinking like kind of the insta-love um, trope or are there any mm -hmm. other kind of things that you you need to have in there um well I mean I'm not big on must-haves I will tell you that you know with every book I try to hit somewhere between two and four tropes with some books hitting as many as seven mm. to eight tropes that oh, makes it wow um, I know it's a lot of tropes, um, yeah. but it, if you blend them all correctly, then it can attract people that don't normally read that particular trope and they'll go, but it has all these other tropes I love. I'll give it a shot. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a real pull for it. Um, so multiple tropes within um, Insta Love specifically. I can't speak for all short stories because, you know, I found uh, recently I found cozy short stories that are under yeah. 20K. That was fascinating. Um, but so for Insta Love, I can say that they readers really like alpha males over the top guys that just kind of charge in and take over. Yeah. Um, that's very popular within the insta-love genre. Yeah. Um, they also are very big on um, just, I don't I don't know the type of word I'm looking for here. Um, I word all day, but don't <laughs> ask me. <laughs> You're wording a lot though, Ma. <laughs> You're wording a lot that's by a me, lot so yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, they're very big on like um, diversity and inclusion in terms mm -hmm. of, I have um, a diverse body ranges, uh, diverse abilities. I have heroes that are in wheelchairs and um, I had one that had an elostomy bag. And I was actually kind of worried that my readers would come back and say they're not alpha enough if they're flawed and they have disabilities and chronic illnesses. But they actually came back and told me that those are some of their favorite characters mm -hmm. and that it made them very uh, relatable and easy to root for. So if you can find a way, um, if you're writing within the Insta Love, to make the heroes diverse in some way. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, there's also race and other issues that you can use to um, create a more diverse, rounded out cast. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly that I just, I, as somebody with chronic illness, I mm -hmm. find it interesting to include heroes and heroines that have it. Mm -hmm. um, so right. that was my kind of take on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love awesome. that. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go so, self-publishing, can I just say? Because yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> that's the beauty. Yeah. One of the one of the key aspects of it, I think, is the ability for for writers to publish what it is they want to read, but also just to include that diversification and in, in their work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just just quickly start, before we go oh, any further, I just want. So what's it? What's your definition of insta love? Like, mm. what do you mean when you're talking about that? So with that, I usually mean like it's an instant connection between the hero and heroine, almost like he knows instantly she's going to be part of the rest of his life. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I hit that stronger and sometimes I don't. It really depends. Um, but yeah, that instant connection, that instant she's meant to be mine, she's meant to be, you know, my future wife, that sort of thing mm. is really with my, what I look at with the insta love. Okay. Because I was thinking that you probably have to have insta love in a shorter story. You don't. You don't think that's the case. You think it can be a. So if I do a slower burn, I usually have had them have a pre-existing relationship, mm. um, right? Or they have a pre-existing relationship where he knows that she's meant to be part of his life, but he's fighting that. Mm. Um, right. Yeah. And my readers respond well to it being the hero making that kind of decision, and that again because we go back to the alpha male. Um, that's very popular within uh, I see it more in the indie romance community and insta loves wow. um, is that over the top male that just looks at her and says she's mine you know mm -hmm. I think it, it kind of reminds me of those um old harlequins you know mm -hmm. yeah. with the like, hair dudes and all that um, yeah yeah those aren't as popular anymore in trad publishing but in indie publishing people still respond really well to that yeah. Um, and I'm just like, if they respond well to it, give the people what they want, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Amen to that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So taking it back a bit to when you very first started and your marketing, I mean, if you've got a marketing background, 
what did you do? Like, did you write a whole lot and start out that way? Um, did you get your covers? Did you get an email newsletter? What was your sort of first steps towards starting out for the newbies amongst us to, to get your success on the road? Um, so what I did, I was, I mentioned this briefly um, in another uh, writing group, but when I started out self-publishing, I was very ill. I was actually bedridden. Um, and I was running two other online businesses. Uh, wow. And wow. Yeah, so that, that was a bit of a challenge. But I, so mainly for marketing, I just focused on building a newsletter. I didn't have a lot of energy or time to dedicate to Facebook mm. and TikTok and all that. Yeah. Those are very cool and very valid ways to um, build your, your writing platform, but I just didn't have the energy and time. And so mm. I wanted to focus on building that backlist and connecting with readers through email. Right. Those were my kind of two goals. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And so yeah. how did you go with your, your newsletter? How did you set about getting more readers and things like that? More, more subscribers? Um, so I did use Book Funnel. I set up a free uh, newsletter magnet that way. Uh, it was just a free short story. It was small town, um, friends to lovers hype. And that's still available on my website. Uh, but I just set that out because I knew I wanted to write kind of small town, southern type. Uh, book so small town friends lovers romance is what I did as a reader magnet and I set that up through book funnel and then I got probably five or six hundred subscribers by joining different promo opportunities on uh, book funnel and the mm -hmm. thing about it is book funnel has some really cool promo opportunities you just want to make sure you join ones that are relevant to your uh, writing mm -hmm. I went into obviously um, book builders for insta love authors I wouldn't have gone into something for like cozy mysteries I would have gotten the wrong type of readers and it would have yeah. been really created a mismatch of expectations on both sides. And that would have created a negative experience. Mm -hmm. um, so you wanna find, you do book funnel, you find promos that are targeted to your niche or somehow relevant to your book. And then um, that helped me with somewhat with the newsletter, but it was still very slow going. And I was getting a lot of people that would subscribe for the freebie and then unsubscribe. Yeah. And that was concerning to me because it wasn't building my fan base. And I wanted my newsletter to be filled with um, just rabid fans, you know, people that absolutely cannot wait for the next book in the Mia Brody universe. Mm. So what I started doing was I started adding a um, newsletter, a, a bonus scene at the end of my books. Mm. I would do literally after the last sentence is typed, the very next paragraph says, you want a bonus scene with so-and-so and it's named the two characters. And it says, mm -hmm. sign up for my weekly newsletter and get it here. And those people that are some of the most loyal newsletter subscribers. They're amazing. Um, I love all my fans. Mm -hmm. um, but they are just amazing and it's grown my newsletter in incredible ways, um, way faster than the book funnel promos. Mm -hmm. um, and the people that get onto the newsletter are staying on it too, because I have a, um, a nurture sequence going, you know, where mm -hmm. it just welcomes them into the email, gives them some info about me, just kind of nurtures them for a couple of weeks. So they get to know me a Brody and then they're added to the main newsletter and they see mm -hmm. it every week. So. Yeah. So you're sending them weekly. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. And what, what kind of content are you putting in them? Do you, do you have a long newsletter or is it a quite a short one? Um, so I don't worry about newsletter length and I don't encourage anyone else to worry about newsletter length. Mm -hmm. um, you want to show up and you want to give your people value. And in our world, uh, that value is entertainment. So mm -hmm. I'm sharing uh, mm -hmm. pre-ordered links to my latest book, uh, excerpts for upcoming books, uh, bonus scenes. I link them back to that because I do mm -hmm. have regular subscribers that go, hey, um, how do I find the bonus scenes? So a week or two after I uh, sent out a book, I send them another newsletter that says, hey, did you happen to see the bonus scene? Because people do miss it. People forget it. Mm -hmm. They don't know what the link is. Um, so I do that sort of stuff. I give book recommendations to other books because I'm always newsletter swapping too. Um, and that's fun as well. Uh, you can also do surveys. I sent out a survey to find out what my readers wanted. And mm -hmm. they told me by and large, it was really surprising. They said, we want more steamy scenes. Mm -hmm. They said, throw more. They said, throw more sex in there. And I said, okay. Yeah, okay. And so I've included more love scenes now and it's working. Yeah. So that's so interesting. So I've got a, <laughs> just a quick question on the logistics of this because my, my, my brain is visual and I'm thinking, okay, bonus scene for book A. So the reader signs up to your newsletter, gets that bonus scene. How, like, do you have a different, um, welcome sequence for each of your books or do you kind of bring them into a series how do, how do you just <laughs> how does it work <laughs> uh, well I'm a big fan of keeping things simple so I put them all into the same funnel nice um, there's, 
there's an exception if you sign up for like, there's a free cowboy book I have. Um, and a lot of the people that signed up for that were already subscribers, which I knew. Mm -hmm. So I had it mark, if you're already a subscriber, don't put them into the walking sequence. But gotcha. if they're not a subscriber, put them into the walking sequence. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just kind of what I do. Uh, yeah. And that keeps it really simple for mm -hmm. me. Nice. That's cool. And so do they get access then to all the different um, mm -hmm. bonus epilogues for the different books? What I do is I put all the bonus epilogues on a single page so uh -huh. you can visit that and find everything all at once. Oh, um, that's I brilliant. Yeah, I actually got the idea from Vanessa Vale. So. Oh, she's a goddess, yes. just saying. Um, if, you have, if you haven't read any Vanessa Vale people, V-A-L-E is the surname. You need to go mm -hmm. and read Vanessa Vale if you want how to do steamy like man mm -hmm. she's awesome um mm -hmm. the so that makes perfect sense and also people will be reading that and i know i've done this myself though they, they know they will read a bonus scene but they might not have read the book so it's another way of kind of back funneling if you like them to to go and get that book that is correct and what i actually do is i've been on author websites where i've actually stumbled across bonus scenes without having even read the book Mm. So what I do on mine is on my bonus page, I actually link to the book and I say, read now mm. that way, if they haven't read the book and maybe they've just stumbled upon my site, or even if they read it a long time ago and they want to reread it, mm -hmm. they can click read now. And then yeah. at the bottom of my bonus scene, I always do very next paragraph. Hey, you know, for another protective alpha male read, and I recommend another book, usually mm. the next book in the series or the next series, but I always recommend another book. As soon as I get you into my funnel, I want to keep you as long as possible. And if I'm writing books that satisfy you, you're not going to be annoyed with me. You're going to be really, really excited and happy. Just the way we are when we sit down to watch our favorite TV shows in the same yeah. universe. You know? Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's so smart. It's so smart. You are so smart, Mia. <laughs> Love this. Uh, so smart. I just, I think that the lesson there is once you've got them to try and keep them, you know, and it doesn't have to, like, you're just delivering more entertainment. It's not, that's yeah. all there is to it. Yeah. <laughs> Simple as that. Did you have something to share? Yeah. Well, I was just going to, well, one of them was uh, was how that they, how would you get them to get all of the bonus scenes um, without um, just picking them up and not getting the books? But that kind of answered it in a nutshell, really, because what what you don't really care because mm. you were going to promote the book. So they're going to, you know, they're going to come full circle. If they haven't already got it, they're going to get it. Mm -hmm. And if they have got it, they'll get the bonus anyway. So that's really cool. So can I ask, what are the price points for um, Insta Love? So you could do any price point you want, obviously. Um, I prefer a $2.99 price point and I'm not KU, um, hmm. which not always a popular decision, but I mean, it works for me mm -hmm. and I'm not going to tell another writer, don't do it if it works for them. You know, I mean, if you're making absolutely. the kind of money you want and you're getting the kind of fan base you want, absolutely stay with KU. Um, I didn't feel comfortable doing it um, just because I know that some of issues with Zon that have come up mm -hmm. recently. So I went wide um, and that means I have to take my books out of KU, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and readers that complain about that, what I always say is I just say, you know what? I understand your frustration. Why don't you come join the ARC team? You can get the books for free. Mm. Uh, <laughs> that yeah, kind I of love that. It's community. a brilliant answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so you went, I know that you went um, wide and you talked about it, how you did it a certain way. Can you talk about that? Like the, how you went from being in KU to being wide? Yes. You know what I'm talking okay. about? So the general, I was six months into um, my publishing career. So this was September, 2021. And I had published probably 16 books or so because I'd originally thought I could do it once a week, but I was very, oh, I couldn't keep up with that. Mm. But so I had like 16 books out and I September, six months into KU. And I decided, you know what? I don't want to stay in KU. I want to be white. And traditional advice says, take everything out of KU and fling it wide immediately. And I didn't really feel like that was the best idea. So what I did was I just started, I left everything currently in KU as a nest egg because it was still earning me money. I left that all in KU as a nest egg and just started publishing all new titles wide, mm. everything wide. And I left that nest egg for a long, long time until I built up to a full-time income. And I've just recently taken everything out of KU in the last two or three months. Um, and they'll eventually, all my backlist will go wide too. Um, but yeah, I, I know that some people recommend taking everything immediately out of KU, but then your income drops off. Mm -hmm. It can take up to a year or two to really get that income on wide. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So I don't advise writers that are dependent on KU to just drop out entirely. Um, you know, I would just be honest with my readers. I was like, you know, I'm going in a different direction. These aren't going to be available in KU anymore. You're welcome to come join my ARC team, mm-hmm. you know, and that's how you, you bring them in um, mm-hmm. because it's all about creating a positive experience for the readers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I love you. Thank you so much for supporting me. Thank you so much for supporting my books. Unfortunately, it's part of a business decision. I can't be part of KU anymore. Um, I'm going to go wide. We're going to reach more readers. We're going to have more fans. But at the same time, if you still need them free, because, you know, maybe you can't read outside KU, you don't have the budget or whatever, come over to the ARC team. You're more than welcome to join us there. I'm really happy to have you. Mm-hmm. And just kind of put a positive spin on everything. Always lead with that positivity. You know? Yeah. I think that is such good advice for any dealing with readers on a more broader basis around publishing if you like you know it's the old saying it's a very old saying and because I'm very old but it's like you don't (laughs) that you don't want to see the sausage being made and you don't and I Mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan of authors kind of laying out their business woes if you like to readers because it gets in the way of that entertainment to me it's an entertainment relationship Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. but I think that how you explained it there was a brilliant clever way of doing it that it's your business decision but he but but he you you know acknowledge that you can't may afford it so he and it's still a benefit to you you're still getting the art creator and probably a fan for life that's gonna Mm. be recommending Mm. you another way so that's very so what about sorry what about your marketing continuing going forward what are you doing now amazon are you doing not amazon ads but or what are you doing like facebook ads what do you do for your marketing so I've just been dipping my toe into ads uh, recently. What I've always had the best luck with has been um, my newsletter, obviously, because I've worked hard to grow it. Um, mm-hmm. And that's full of fans. Uh, newsletter swaps with other Insta Love authors. And that doesn't mm-hmm. cost anything. Yeah. Um, obviously, if you're going to do swaps with other newsletter people, make sure that they're in your genre. Yes, I would swap with another romance writer over, say, a horror author. But go even more granular than that. I would not newsletter swap with an Insta love author that writes dark because mm. my light cowboys aren't going to be, their audience is going to be receptive for my light cowboys, my light fluffy cowboys. And at mm. the same time, my audience is going to be possibly a little bit unhappy with the darker romance because they mm. don't read that. So I'm just paying attention to, and I always want to link to other authors that they would read. Um, so think about fellow authors that I would naturally go from this author to that author. Um, that's what I'm kind of thinking is so I wouldn't like go with an author that just writes really really dark when I'm writing especially like if you write like Hallmark type stuff Mm -hmm. like I can see behind Mm -hmm. you you write like cozy romance Mm -hmm. um so you wouldn't go with somebody that wrote a really dark thriller Mm -hmm. it just the audience isn't the same yeah 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 so that's your main marketing tool is your email newsletter Mm -hmm. that's awesome yeah. And I guess, and I guess you would say the the regular publication, the new books, right? So you're writing these mm-hmm. two books. So you're writing and publishing these two books each month. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. That is correct. So could you talk to us a little bit about that process? Like, do you have mm. someone editing them, or are they? Do you just pretty much write them and put them up, or how do you? How does that all work? Um, so before I started publishing fiction, I was ghostwriting nonfiction about a hundred k words a month. Wow. Um, and wow. I, yeah, it was a lot. Um, I eventually let all those clients go to go after the fiction writing dream. But the thing about writing that nonfiction, when you're writing 100K words a month, that's about 3,000 words a day, a little bit over. You don't have time to sit there and just edit and edit and edit. So it taught me to write a clean draft. It taught me oh. to outline and write a very clean draft very quickly. Um, and those are actually skills I rely upon now oh. in my fiction writing is that it taught me to outline, write that clean draft and get it done. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's what I do. And then after I've finished writing it, I um, turn on, Microsoft has a read back feature. Mm -hmm. So I turn that on and read back and I listen for words I left out or um, if the dialogue sounds off, I just pause it and I go fix it right there. Mm -hmm. And then I have it keep reading forward. And that's how I do it. And then I just format and vellum. Cool. And so do you say maybe write one week and then you like, like, I'm just curious how long it takes you to finish a book. Is it the full two weeks or are you? So I'm not currently ahead in my schedule. Um, <laughs> actually, I run a little close to the deadline. My health does impact that. And that's okay. Um, mm-hmm. So I would say I write. I, I, what I really like to do is I like to write, immediately edit and upload um, and just kind of get that book out of me so I can get on to the next one. Um, right. Because I really love staying within that universe and staying within those characters. Mm-hmm. And I want to write that as quickly as, 
as close together as I can so that that has that feeling of cohesion, mm-hmm. you know, um, that writers look for. Yeah. I mean, sorry, that readers look for, not writers. Yeah, I think I think writing two so close together, if you were going backwards and forwards between them, say in the editing process, it could get quite confusing, right? Every month doing that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. I try not to have multiple projects open at once. Right. I try to just have one project at a time that gets all my focus. That yeah. too, I find helpful. I know that some writers like to have multiple books to toggle between, and I, I do respect that. For me, what would happen if I had multiple projects open, I would sit down at the computer and spend two hours debating which one to work on. So for me, if I just have one project, it's like, you know what you're working on, get those words down. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's awesome. So. And are you still writing 3,000 words a day or is that sort of gone back a bit? Oh, no. Um, let's see. I have to probably turn out about, so if I work, if I were to work in 30 days, all 30 days, I would probably work about 1,600 words, maybe a little bit less because mm-hmm. I'm only turning out around 40 to 50K a month. Yeah. So mm-hmm. the schedule is nowhere near as stressful as it used to be. Yeah. Um, well, that's awesome. Good for you. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm a bit stressed thinking about this hundred k a month. Oh my god. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about your outlining process, Mia? Just uh, is it detailed? Is it one paragraph? Just how? What do you use? So what I do is when I I start I start I get a book idea right, and. I first thing I do is I say, okay, what tropes are you hitting? Yeah. And I literally make myself write down a list of the tropes. And then I, I look them up, uh, keywords in uh, Publisher Rocket. Mm-hmm. And yeah. from there, I write the blurb using the keywords and the tropes and all of that, put everything together. Um, I find I tried to write blurbs after I've written a book and it's like pulling teeth. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know why. I guess I, some of the sparkles gone by that point. <laughs> yeah yeah I'm <laughs> so over that yes yes so I write the blurb and then I sit down to write the outline and I actually have for my 20k um, books I have a 10 chapter outline it's formatted his POV her POV and it notes the scenes mm-hmm. as well as the romantic beats that I'm hitting mm-hmm. um, so then I just fill that out kind of okay this scene happens here this is the romantic beat we're hitting so I know like in chapter seven usually is about the time typically I have the sexy moments. So I know that to hit that there. Mm-hmm. So I say, okay, this is what happens in her POV. This is what happens in his POV. Then like chapter eight is usually the black moment. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes if I'm running a little short on words, it'll be fun and games first. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> I, I, will, I will adjust on the fly. I love my outline and I use it to, again, create that clean draft and get that book just turned out like that but I'm also not afraid to deviate a little when it needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's important too, because the outline there is a tool that serves me. Um, I'm not a slave to the outline. It serves me. mm -hmm. And that's important for writers to keep in mind. I love that. Um, And what, with the point of view, is it third person, first person? Like, is there a preference? Is it like, what's the kind of the standard, would you say in the shorter romance market? So this is actually really interesting, but, in Insta Love, I have noticed um, first person dual POV. You get the mm-hmm. hero and the heroine works best. Um, yeah, and in it's interesting because Insta Love, if you do paranormals, I see more third person dual mm. POV. Mm-hmm. So that's really interesting to me. That yeah, just it's still Insta Love, but if you switch just a hair over to the paranormals, like wolf shifters and stuff, you usually mm. see more third person POV. I find that fascinating. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is interesting. Mm. It is. I wonder if it's because it just needs the the focus needs to pull back just a tad to see maybe the paranormal world a bit more maybe I don't know that's just I guess off the top of my head or maybe it's just coming from (laughs) yeah or I mean as a as a long-term paranormal reader I'm used to third person and maybe that just carries on you know Mm. as well what I wondered about too is Mm. if because when I see longer or even trad published um the books I see more third person yeah and so that made me curious if that influenced it as well yeah Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. good question it's a that's one to one for the ages um (laughs) the do you enjoy writing in first person as you do like do you find that natural for you uh yes I've written in first person for 
let's see, I used to write in third person, but I started writing in first person and found I just really liked how it flowed better. Mm-hmm. Um, for a while, I thought I was going to write young adult. Um, I didn't end up publishing young adult. And then I thought I was going to do new adult, didn't do that either. Um, but, and both of those genres are heavy on first person POV. Mm-hmm. So that's what I sw- switched to using. Uh, and I found I really liked it. When mm-hmm. I started looking into Insta Love, though, I did um, pull back and pay attention. I was like, am I looking at first person or third person? Mm-hmm. Because that was a big question for me is I want to hit the genre expectations. Mm-hmm. Um, exactly. So I read heavily in the genre. I still read heavily in the genre. Um, I think it's so important as a, as a writer to always be absorbing other ideas and new perspectives and all that. It creates mm-hmm. this a vivid writing well for me to draw from when it comes time for me to put my words down. Yeah. hundred mm, wow. percent. Cool. Absolutely. And I think that's, I see if there's any one golden ticket, which I absolutely don't agree with or, but people are always looking for that one, you know, that secret. And I think that's it, honestly, is the fact that you read, what was it? 300 books before you actually started. Like it's absolutely understanding, nailing those reader expectations and understanding, you know, I think it's it's pretty arrogant to be honest for writers to think that they can just look at one or two and think, you know, but I see it all the time in writers forums and it drives me nuts, but I've, I've learned through bitter experience not to comment on it. <laughs> yeah, it's a great call, Sha. <laughs> Can I just ask cool. about the covers? Who does the covers for you? Um, okay. So when I first started publishing, I didn't want to, I'm not, I believe in investing in your business. Absolutely. And I look at publishing as a business, yeah. um, but I didn't, I didn't have a whole lot to invest in. I'm running two other businesses. I'm, you know, I'm really busy. I'm bedridden. So I asked my sister who was interested a little bit in Photoshop. I said, what can you create me? She said, sure, I can do this. Mm -hmm. Um, And so she started doing them until this past year. And I knew she wasn't going to do it long-term and she was clear about that. And I was like, okay, whatever you can do to help me now, I appreciate. Um, So in this year, she started training me to make the covers. And I started creating my own covers in um, Courage County Bride series. Um, and that was fun. So I created those. And then this past month or two, I started working with Cormar covers. I love her. She does beautiful work. And the only reason I'm no longer making my own covers is just because it took so much time from me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I definitely enjoyed the process of creating the covers and whatnot, but I felt like she could do it better and she could do it faster. Yeah. And I was like, I can take those four days, spend them right, literally writing an insta love if I want and make the money back that I'm going to pay for a cover. Yeah, I was like, so let's just invest that back into the career. And yeah. let's take that time and use that time on valuable app. And that's the thing about it too, is there are tasks that only you can do in your writing career. And one of those is writing. Mm-hmm. But anybody can design you a cover. Yeah. Anybody can say, even write your blurb for you. Um, but only you can write the story. Mm-hmm. So if you're at this point where you're making money and there are tasks that are taking you a long time and you're not, they're taking you so long and taking you away from that writing and that creativity, then absolutely don't be afraid to outsource them. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Very good call. Cool. Yeah. What was the name of that cover designer? Um, so it's Cormar Covers. I can, uh, let's see, it's C-O-R-M-A-R Covers. Mm-hmm. And she is just the sweetest thing. She does a lot of the romance covers. Um, If you write romance, absolutely get a romance cover artist. But obviously, if you're in a different genre, you'd want to get a cover artist that works with your genre. Um, So I have a question just going back to when you were um, particularly around mailing lists and and, um, swapping like newsletter features. How did you actually kind of meet other Insta Love authors? Sure. Um, So the first thing I did was I began reading heavily in the genre. Mm-hmm. And I particularly paid attention to people that were regularly hitting the top hundred list. Yeah. I said, because they have nailed reader expectations of what readers want. So these mm-hmm. are the people I need to be paying attention to. So I started friending them on Facebook. And um, as I began friending them on Facebook, I noticed they were all part of this one uh, group, Writing Insta Love. So I went and joined the Writing Insta Love group. And that's where I found even more Insta Love authors. <laughs> to talk with and swap with and all that. And that is so important to me. And it's something I teach writers. I say, find your community, mm-hmm. find your people and associate mm-hmm. with them. Not only is it encouraging, you know, you, you get that encouragement, you get people to bounce ideas off of, you get people that have been through similar things. Uh, I just messaged somebody the other day. I was like, my print books came out terrible. I said, what do I do? 
She said, adjust the print settings in vellum. I said, I didn't know I could. He yes. said, yeah, I should. But I said, no, oh, that is awesome. Yeah. So that, that's why you, you have these writer friends and you make these communities, hmm. you know, and you give back, obviously. You don't just take. Um, and I try to always show up, give value back to my people um, because I love them and I want them to succeed. And the thing about it is, is I know that some writers can get sometimes a little jealous and uh, envious and that that's natural, but I'm a huge, huge believer in that nobody can take the good that's coming for me. Mm-hmm. I can't take it. You can't take it. Nobody can mess with that. Yeah. And that means when you succeed, I can rejoice with you mm-hmm. because that's your good. And that was intended for you. And what's yeah. coming for me is intended for me and nobody can take that, you know, and it doesn't yeah. matter what anybody else does or says, because what's meant to be mine will be mine and what's meant to be yours will be yours. Love and that. so we rejoice with each other. Mm. Yeah. And readers are voracious. They, they don't, they don't, they need more than one author. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's Absolutely. awesome. I can imagine they're reading more than one book a day for the Insta Love mm. readers. Like, mm. you know, they will be. Mm-hmm. absolutely yeah, reading more than one a day gracious readers yeah. can I just go quickly back I know we've sort of moved on from it but I'm really curious about so you talked about writing in the um in the same universe and you found that so I, I don't think you did that originally and you moved to that sort of in more recent books do you do yeah. um I don't mean it doesn't quite make sense but do, what do you think about like cliffhangers and things like that do you have connected books in that way or you don't really like how do you promote read through between your books in the series Okay, so with cliffhangers, I know that some authors find them extremely successful. Um, and this comes, again, back to reading your genre. I don't see them used heavily within the insta love genre. Mm-hmm. So if you're looking to come into the insta love genre, we'd love to have you. I don't advise cliffhangers then. Okay. Um, but there are certain genres that will encourage cliffhangers. And you need to, that's why you need to read heavily mm-hmm. and know whether or not readers like them in mm-hmm. that genre. So in insta love, we don't really like cliffhangers. They want that happily ever after, give them that complete ending. Um, mm-hmm. If you can even fast forward, you know, a few months to a few years and give them a complete, you know, family picture, something kind of gooey and happy, um, they love that even more. We are here for that gooey happiness. Yeah. Uh, so that's what you do there. You want to end it completely with that couple. But what I try to do is I try to bring in the character from the very next book, usually the mm-hmm. hero, because again, my readers are usually there for the alpha heroes. I bring him in, hopefully in an interesting and exciting way, make them kind of curious about him. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like in one book I just mentioned, you know, after an accident, he retreated on the family farm and built his own cabin and was really never seen again in town. Um, And that kind of created this feeling in my readers, like what happened? What accident was involved? Why did he retreat? Why isn't he seen in town? You know, all these questions. So that causes them to pick up the next book. And of course, at the end of book seven, I'm saying, hey, go read the bonus scene. They go and read the bonus scene. At the end of the bonus scene, I'm saying, hey, do you, do you remember this character from this that you had questions about? He's over here in his own book. Okay, mm-hmm. go, go, go buy that. Um, so that's what I'm kind of doing mm-hmm. is I'm constantly linking them. Yeah. And that's what it is, is I'm always putting little, um, what do you call them? I don't know if you know. Uh, yes, breadcrumbs, but in uh, video games, we have Easter eggs, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I always put Easter. I love to do that with every book an Easter egg for a future book and an Easter egg from a past book. Ooh. It's a character oh. that you remember from another part of the series and go, oh, that's what happened to that secondary character. That's so neat. She dated that guy. Yeah. And you go, oh, okay. And so yeah. just little Easter eggs. And then it gives this feeling of we really are in this universe and there really are all these people. Love that. It's such a clever idea. Oh, man, you are a clever cookie. Well, actually, that just brings me on to... Um, the amount of characters you can have in an insta love because yeah. because it's a shorter book you can't have like the whole town in it like you would maybe a contemporary romance so what what, what do you do <laughs> um so with uh insta love what i like to do is you know you get the hero and the heroine mm-hmm. um and then i like to bring of course in a character that's going to be the star of the next book again right. in a way that's exciting and then anybody that needs to support the story Mm-hmm. For example, if the heroine's best friend is the one that encourages her to go sleep with the firefighter that's hot and he ends up being her new boss, mm-hmm. then obviously we need a best friend to put in there. And then the best friend may appear in another book or she may not. In that particular book, she doesn't appear again. But um, mm-hmm. just mention her again throughout. Oh, yeah, I've been texting so-and-so her best friend. That way the best mm-hmm. friend isn't forgotten. <laughs> yeah. Right, yes, <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. In Insta Love, yes, keeping your cast smaller is going to work in your favor in Insta Love. Yeah. But, you know, I mentioned like, Ernie's Diner and like anytime the characters need to go out for a burger in different books Ernie's Diner 
And it mm-hmm. creates this feeling yeah. of, I don't know if you ever saw Gilmore Girls. with Yeah. 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 Remember how you know certain locations? Yeah. In TV yeah. Shows? That's the same yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Pick certain yeah. town locations. People love that. Yeah. Yeah. But don't we all, uh, when you're watching Gilmore Girls, wouldn't you love to have gone to Luke's diner, you know? And yeah. I mean, it's always mysteriously open when it's snowing and, you know, it just yes. looks warm and cozy and, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I love that. That mm-hmm. feeling it's of belonging, grumpy. I think, you know, yeah. is what people are looking for as well yeah. as the romance. But it's also that community feeling that, yeah. you know, these days without getting too, you know, out there is is often that people are missing, you know. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. I think yeah, it, it speaks to that as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'd really like to know about the heat level because um, I don't believe it's just one heat level and it's the levels up to it. You know, like you, there are different you know, some are more steamy than others, yes? Yes, I have seen different heat levels within the genre. Mm-hmm. I will say that I have never really seen an Insta Love with closed door. Mm-hmm. I know that there are authors that are going to start launching some um, short and sweet ones mm-hmm. that don't have any open door, and they're going to push and see if they can create a market for it, mm-hmm. create a readership for it. That'll be fascinating to watch, mm-hmm. and I would love to see them succeed. Um, but for right now, I see open door, but how explicit it is really kind of depends. I've mm-hmm. seen uh, books with one love scene, very kind of um, just generalized, not heavy on body parts or fluids or anything like that. And I've seen ones that are very explicit and they have multiple love scenes throughout the book. And mm-hmm. you actually, if you, they were actually erotica and that's fine by me. I don't care. Um, but I'm saying I, so I see it in all oh, insta love crosses from you know just open door generalized to really steamy heavy mm-hmm. stuff so you you have a quite the, the gamut gamut there you can write mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah 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 where would you say yours fits within that are you bordering on the more steamy hot 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 <laughs> I, I would say no no uh, no i probably medium heat i would right. argue Okay. I would say that high, high heat usually falls into erotica. And the right. thing about erotica is if you take out the um, love scenes, erotica falls apart. Yeah. That's how you usually know it's an erotica. But with romance, if I went back through my books and I closed all the doors, they would still stand. Wow. The story would still stand. Um, and that's not a judgment about that either way. No, it's and just a, no. Everybody likes different it's stuff. Point, but that's though. just mm. the different... Mm. erotica won't stand without the love scenes but romance will mm. and that's how you kind of know what you're reading mm. and I mean I read in both genres and I know writers that write in both genres and it's just very different animal and you have to be aware yeah. of that when you and again that goes back to yeah. knowing your market mm. yeah. and reading that and knowing okay this is what my readers expect mm-hmm. mm. yeah 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 makes that's sense very true yeah. so I'm curious so I know um you, you've mentioned um, that you ha- you've got a chronic illness and that you were when you first started you were bedridden I'm just like how how do you get through something like that like I'm sure we've got listeners who are in a similar situation to you mm. how did you kind of um yeah basically get kind of motivate get, yeah motivate yeah, yourself get and get going yeah. yeah um so honestly it was really hard and I would write the books crying a lot of times oh. um, but I would put up the next pre-order as I was uploading that book. And I would be like, you can't disappoint the fans. You have a pre-order out. And that outer, that outer expectation, that deadline outside of myself helped me to keep going one foot in front of the other, Mm -hmm. one more book up, right? One more word, one more chapter. You can do this. Mm -hmm. Um, And I mean, it was hard, but at the same time, I believed it was possible and Mm -hmm. I kept going. um, And it was just, it was really hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of determination there. I think you're yeah. I get yeah. the impression that you're a very determined admired, person. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> At what a, point did you drop your other businesses off? Was it, did you say it was like six months in? Sorry, I'm just looking. I'm just trying to work out how you're juggling everything right back then, particularly when you were so unwell. Yeah, it was, it was challenging. Um, just taking those good moments and mm. really using them to my advantage too. Um, you know, if I was having a particularly good hour of writing as fast as I could, you know, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't even have a laptop. My mom gave me a laptop when I was bedridden. I was like, awesome. And I just started typing from the bed. Um, wow. Yeah. So let's see. I did for 15 months, both 
um, the two businesses and mm-hmm. the writing. Wow. Uh, which for me, the 15 month mark, I knew that I was making enough and I was still bedridden at this point. I knew I was making enough from the fiction that I could give it a full time go mm-hmm. and it would be okay. Um, and that's a, really why I held on to those two businesses while I started mm-hmm. that is because, um, again, with my business background, most business ventures take between three and five years to hit profitability. And I said, publishing is a business venture. It could take three to five years to hit profitability. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be eating Raymond during that time. Yeah. I said, hang on to those two businesses <laughs> and keep writing. And then yeah. we're going to make it all work. Mm-hmm. Um, so about 15 months in, I realized, hey, you're hitting full time. You know, you thought this would take three to five years. Let's go back and look at the businesses and see if we can close them out. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, it was possible. So oh, fantastic. I was blessed. Awesome. That is so, absolute. Um, that will be giving a huge number of people, a huge number mm-hmm. of listeners, as well as ourselves, inspiration. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Is it? Did you have? Do you feel like you had to? Um, like this mindset stuff there that you worked on, or is it just you just were determined to make it happen, and it just that's what you did? Like, did you have to give yourself pep talks? I don't know. <laughs> I am a huge, huge believer in mindset. I heard someone once say, and it's always stuck with me and I've carried it with me, that you should never speak over your life, something you don't want to come true. Oh, you only say things about yourself, about your writing career that you absolutely want to come true. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would tell myself, you're going to be a success. You're going to do this. Um, You're going to write these books. One day your name is going to be on those uh, top hundred bestseller lists on Amazon. Um, you're you're headed that way this is going to be your story too and even now making a full-time living now I'm going okay one day you're going to be the millionaire author Mm -hmm. you know and it's funny because it just keeps going and there's always a new mountain to climb and I love that I love the challenge and Mm -hmm. that I think is so important in life is to find something you enjoy so much that even on the bad days you love the challenge uh grit by Angela Duxworth I believe Mm -hmm. her name yes about this fantastic book but yes, I'm huge on mindset. Um, mindset actually helped me build the businesses that allowed me to launch a writing career. Um, so that I'm huge, huge on mindset. Absolutely love the topic. Um, you know, I believe that words have power and that I type and I create worlds that people want to live in. Mm-hmm. And if I speak something, I can create a world I want to live in. Mm-hmm. Very That's powerful. Awesome. Love that. Mm. Absolutely love that. I'm assuming that you're familiar with Lee Savino and Renee Rose and their author abundance that we've we've had both ladies on our podcast and big fans. Big fans. So yeah, yeah. I yeah. Awesome. Okay. Have we got any more questions for oh, no, so many, but I just yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just basking in Mia's processing. Just processing. Mia's yeah. inspiration and positivity and just, you know, um, thank you for being a leading light in this because I also just wanna say if anybody is writing short romances um we'll put the link in the show notes but to the writing it's to love group and your posts are just and i absolutely met this 100 percent uh just um they just hit every tick every marketing box for me as a as a fellow marketer um but it's just really good solid advice and and so positive and you're very generous with particularly with newer authors and and you know God bless you for that. <laughs> so thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. And so just, just as a final question, is there anything else, Mia, that you, you want to um, say to our listeners to encourage or to mm. the piece of advice that, that you wish you'd gotten maybe when you were starting out? Um, you know, the one thing I would tell you is to keep going. And yeah. that sounds so trite. And I know that some days it doesn't, it feels like, okay, well, that's easy for her to say. But I mean, that wasn't easy when I was bedridden. I know what it's like to sit there and sob through the words and just typing literally, you know, those words after my doctor has told me, hey, you've come as far as medical science can. We don't know how to help you anymore. And you've tried every medication. We're sorry. Um, And sitting there and typing that and still saying, you got to keep going. You got to give me five more, you know? And that's the thing is you have to, you have to be your own coach, your own cheerleader, your own encourager. Um, absolutely reach out for support with other writers too Um, but definitely create a a, just a voice in your own head that is encouraging that uh, challenges you to become your best self you know be your own best friend on the journey Mm -hmm. that is so so valuable to me is that Mm -hmm. I don't I don't and I I meet 
people all the time and they open their mouths and they talk about themselves. And I think to myself, I would hate to live in your head. You're so mean and not out oh, to other yeah. people. They're mean to themselves. Oh, yeah. 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 No, no, no. Love yourself. Treat yourself with compassion. Treat writer you with compassion. Treat yourself with compassion. I mean, just that is so important. Be your best friend, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that is awesome very true. Word. Oh, wow. Lovely. I've got tingles. That was yeah, that need, that's, that needs to be on T-shirts, tote bags, and those airplane um, flying flags <laughs> behind because we are. We, we're often, and I say collectively here, but personal we too, we're often so mean to ourselves when we're not producing what we think we should or not seeing the sales that we think, mm. you know, we want to get to. And it's mm. it, it's very easy to slip into that. So that's yeah. really good that's advice. Beautiful. So mm. thank you so much for coming and joining us here today in the spa mirror. It's been for awesome. Me. Yeah. We really appreciated it. Thank you. Thank you for letting us interrogate you on all things. Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> okay, it didn't feel like that. But. <laughs> um, so if someone wants to, to uh, find you or to check out um, your books or to ask questions, we can. Where's the best place to go? Um, you can find me on Facebook. You can find me through my website. I'm like I love hearing from people. I, I love when uh, other authors pop into my box and ask me questions or we chat. I love that. Um, awesome. So any, any place, uh, Facebook's fine. I'm, I have Twitter, but I'm not really on there. <laughs> so I'm much better on Facebook or um, on my website. I have a contact form. You can reach out that way. Um, awesome. I just, I love hearing from people. That's great. Thank you so much for that. And um, Sha, where can we be found? Where we can be found at spargirlspodcast.com where you've got all our previous um, episodes and show notes and resources on there as well and if you'd like to come along and join our Facebook group we're at um, patreon.com forward slash spa girls podcast and you can come and help support us there and we love you for it so thank you very much awesome so yeah. thank you all for joining us for another episode of the spa girls podcast we appreciate all of the time that you spend with us um, but for now it's farewell and we'll be back farewell. again next week bye, bye. bye.